do have the means, being methodological skepticism, we do have the means to attain an understanding of the absolute truth of reality. And then from that point, we can reconstruct, right? You can think of this phase, this skeptical phase, as a deconstructive phase. Deconstruction in the sense of a, a, a delineation, a breaking apart, a segmentation, an itemization of reality. Categorization. No, a categorization would be reconstruction, but, you know, a, a breaking apart. Once we arrive at that absolute understanding, that absolute truth, that serves as the seminal point, sort of literally, the seminal point for our reconstructive. Right? This is now where we can prove and demonstrate, no, that the external world exists, my mind exists, my relationship to others exists, and da 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 Okay. So we got a little bit advanced there, but hopefully I didn't go too quickly because um, I wanted to usher you into that recognition rather gradually. Okay. So the basic epistemological question then The basic epistemological question The basic epistemological question What counts as knowledge and what does not? What is knowledge and what is not? Remember, this is basic. We can advance it, right? We can then, you should immediately be thinking, introductory question, what is knowledge, what is not? More advanced question is, how do I know that my knowledge is reliable? How do I know that another's knowledge is not reliable? Reliability advances our epistemological inquiry. That's very important, right? And that was, that was off the top. Reliability advances our epistemological inquiry. The last time, reliability advances. The question of reliability, the incorporation of reliability into our epistemological models advance the nature of our inquiry. It makes it that much more rich. Right? It's not simply the case that um, I want to know what is knowledge and what is not, it's, which, is, which is an important question. A more advanced epistemological question is I want to know why is it, how is it the case that what I understand of the external world, what I assume to be knowledge, is itself reliable. And th there's a whole different construction and metrics needed in order to answer that question. I'm not going to get into that now because that's way too advanced. Um, so what counts as knowledge and what does not? I'll explain the uh, relevance in a second. Among all things, this is a direct quote from the text, among all things, among all the things I believe or take to be true, what amounts to knowledge and what does not? Right? Among all the things, and, and, and this seems like a very sort of average question. It doesn't seem like it's a deep question. The question is actually profoundly deep, right? Among all the things I believe, among all the things that I believe, right? Among everything that I believe or take to be true, what of the, all of those beliefs amount to knowledge? Everyone's not going to subscribe to this representation, right? This is just one version of it. But the idea is, of everything that I believe, of all the things that I hold to be true, of those things, right? So a segment of those things, of those things, what of those beliefs can I identify as truth? I mean, as, as knowledge. So the question then becomes, we recognize in a very sort of I mean, this is an introduction to epistemology, so if this is your first time thinking about this, I can understand. I mean, I remember myself, uh, as a matter of fact, coming as an undergrad, the first time I took epistemology, I was like, this is crazy. But specifically at this point in the lecture, um, and shout out to my epistemology professor, Hopley. Um, Hopley, Hopley was a very engaging instructor. He made, this, he made this incredibly appealing. The idea, and this is not his lecture, this is my lecture, but I remember my response, my, my feeling when I recognized this for the first time. Holy crap! You can have beliefs which, which have um, attained sufficient reliability to count and, or verification to count for knowledge, and then you have beliefs that don't, right? So that, and, and if you think about this in a simple sense, it, it makes complete sense, right? It's almost impossible to deny this. From a rational standpoint, the things that I believe which should, could, should, if you want to be an ethicist, right? Um, there are things which I believe that do count as knowledge. I believe that um, 
I am married with two kids. <laughs> um, it's not just the case that I believe that. I believe that because I know that. And I know that because it is in fact too. I am in fact married with two kids. I mean, right? Sort of simple. Okay, um, I believe that um, when I go back to my car, it'll still be there. And there's actually philosophical examples that talk about weird stuff like this. It's going to get, this lecture series, you'll see epistemologists have a field day with hypothetical situations. We're going to have a party when it comes to hypothetical situations. We'll create all types of weird concoctions to talk about epistemological bits. And cars usually come up. Cars, the color red, stuff like that always come up. Your brain in a box and a vat, all this weird stuff we'll talk about much later. But the idea is, I believe that. I don't know that. I won't know that until I get there and I see it. Right? So that you, no, yeah, that, that definitely makes sense, right? I can have belief that my car will be there, and my belief is justified, and I'll talk about that because I parked it, and I remember where I parked it, and, you know, okay. Um, and I will be able to verify my belief in the external world when I go to my car and my car is there. Okay, cool. So if you agree with both of those points, you have to agree that there are beliefs that we have that count as knowledge, and then there are beliefs that we have that don't count as knowledge. Right? I don't think about implications, right? You've got to be fair. Don't think about implications, but at least at that level, at this very rudimentary level, we have to recognize that there are beliefs that individual perceivers have, and here's the point, that don't count as knowledge, that fail to count as knowledge. There are beliefs that perceivers have that do count as knowledge. Hold on a second. The system in which we legitimize, justify, those beliefs that do count as knowledge and those beliefs that don't count as knowledge is going to be the thrust of much of the epistemology that we're going to do. Okay, so, I mean, I know that's a little bit advanced, but the idea is, since we recognize the example that I gave you first was obviously true, and my belief was justified by my knowledge, in a very sort of super to understand, anybody could understand this, I believe that I'm married with two kids, and I can verify this belief because I know I'm married. And if I needed to prove it, I can pull out my, my marriage certificate and I can pu pull out the birth certificates with my name on it. We could do DNA testing, right? There's, it can get ridiculous to demonstrate the fact that my belief is justified in the world. Then there are instances where my belief is itself contingent on some form of proof, verification, demonstration, different epistemological camps will have a different way, a different term they use, but there is a sense in which I need to be active in the world. I need to literally walk out the office, walk down, walk out the door, walk to the car. There it is. Yes, my belief that my car is there is in fact right. right? So what we recognize in a very, very general sense then, in a very, very sort of obvious sense, is that the way in which we talk about our beliefs and our knowledge is going to be contingent on some demonstration, some activity. And there's going to have to be a system in place that legitimizes what counts and what doesn't. And that's going to be problematic, right, for, for many. Um, so that's really, conceptually speaking, the, the really grand picture of what we're going to be doing in this lecture series. And we're going to go, I'm going to go really deep into this. Because each sort of epistemological camp has their own interpretive justification of what counts and what doesn't. And it's not to me to say, well, this one's good and this one's bad. It's this is what they say. This is what they say. This is how this was done. This was how this was done. You decide what you like and you pick whatever epistemological system um, suits your fancy. But you have to have an understanding of all the different systems of justification or critiques in, in terms of skepticism of, of systematization as such. Um, and then you make the decision on your own, right? So I'm not here to, to, to tell you what to believe. I'm, I'm just here to sort of lay out the, the very, very basic foundation of uh, the bigger picture. Okay, and then the very last thing of section one, and then we'll conclude. Section one is, later we will revisit the assumption posed in this diagram, but for now, knowledge is a subset of belief, right? <clears throat> um, it's not that everyone's going to believe this, right? Everyone doesn't believe. All epistemologists, I'm not saying that all epistemologists, <clears throat> Epistemologists believe that knowledge is a subset of belief, <clears throat> but know that there is